2 Corinthians chapter 5. I know you said, I just got to Genesis. I had to figure it out. Now you're going to the New Testament. That's okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. How many read at least a page of the Bible this week? You read in the Bible. Good. That's good. Yeah, I hope you're doing that every day. If not, you're missing the reminder. You know, we have to remember. That's the human condition, isn't it? We forget. <laughs> we forget. You know, why are we in such a pickle we're in in our nation? Because we've forgotten. Why did Israel get in the pickle they got in over and over again? Because they forgot who made them. Israel wasn't a nation. I mean, Israel's been in the news the last two days. Israel wasn't a nation. Israel was a, one man named Abraham that God said, I'm going to make a nation out of. That's all it was. And out of Abraham, they went into Egypt. Now just 70 souls, Jacob and his family. It's just 70 but they come out two and a half million people. And God made a nation. And yet how quickly they forgot. He said, when you go in the land and this Canaan land is promised on this land that flows with milk and honey, when you get it right there and you live in houses you didn't build in cities you didn't build and you eat of olive yards and vineyards that you didn't plant, beware lest you forget the God that gave it. Listen, every time we baptize, God's reminding us of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. You understand that every one of us need to take a trip to Calvary every day. Every day we need to go to Calvary and see Jesus hanging there. A person that doesn't look like a man, doesn't even look like a human, doesn't look like just a piece of flesh up there. He became the, you say, I don't want to go to Calvary. I don't want to see all that. You need to see it. Because he be, Jesus Christ, the lovely Lamb of God, became the most ugly thing in the universe. He became your sin and my sin. We need to remember the death, burial, and resurrection. Next Sunday night, we'll have the Lord's table and observe the Lord's Supper. And why did God give us these two ordinances? So we would remember Jesus died. His body was broken for you and for me. His blood was shed on Calvary, not for anything he ever did, but for your sin and for mine. See, we, we, we forget so quickly, don't we? I mean, we look nice. We've showered. Thank you for showering. We're, we're, we have our hair fixed. And we look nice today, but I'll tell you what we are. The smell of hell, the sulfur stench. That's what we are, just hell-deserving sinners. Don't forget. Don't forget where Jesus found you. Hey, don't forget that you're just still that hell-deserving sinner. Oh, he saved you by his grace. Praise God. But if you got what you deserve today, you don't deserve heaven. Neither do I. We need to remember. So quickly we forget. We get swelled up in our own pride. God has to take us again to help us to see Remember Calvary. Remember what Jesus did for you. Remember your life was the one. It was your death. That was your cross. And now your life is my life. Jesus gave his life so he could live his life through you and through me. Remember, it's not your life. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. But this week we thought we were our own man and we did what we wanted and we had our own ideas and we did our plans. And Jesus all the while paid and bought with his precious blood, you and me. If you're lost here today, I want you to know Jesus is still willing to forgive. He's still cleansing sinful men. He's still receiving sinful men. Men and women, boys and girls that will come to him, he'll save. But those of us that are saved, we need to be reminded that Jesus loves us and Jesus died for us. And every time we see the cross, we need to think of his great love and his great sacrifice. Remember, oh, how many times in the Bible, the prophets, the human penmen, the preachers in the New Testament, from Paul to Peter and on, let me remind you, let me remind you, I call you to remembrance today of what God has done. How soon we forget. Oh, what a Savior we have this morning. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as we come to this passage, it's a powerful passage. It's, it's a chapter that 
We could not preach in one service. There's no way. We're just going to focus on verse 14 to 21, but let's begin reading verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, speaking of our body, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. What he's saying is every time you sin, if you, if you walk with God at all, every time you sin inside, you groan. Oh, Lord, I don't want to sin. I don't want to hurt you. This body, this flesh is so weak. I groan. Lord, I want to be delivered from this body of sin. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of failing you. I'm tired of having to come back again and say, I'm sorry for what I thought. I'm sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for what I did. You say, Pastor, I hadn't done any of that this week. Then you don't know how far from God you really are. Every thought you thought this week was God's thoughts. Every word you said were God's words. Every action you did was pleasing in his sight. Oh, there's only one person that lived that way, the Lord Jesus. Amen. See, our body, we groan. That's what Paul, the Apostle Paul, this is him talking. <laughs> we groan. Read Romans 7. The Apostle Paul, come on, we know we're not a better Christian than him. But the Holy Spirit of God is working if we would listen. And inside we groan, oh God, that we would be delivered from this body of death. That's what Romans 7, as he says, that we might be like you. We might have a body like you and no longer living in this flesh. Continue. Verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest, the down payment, earnest money, like you would pay to buy a car or a house, earnest money, this down payment of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. For we are, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. What is he saying? He's saying as long as we live here, yes, we have the earnest, the Holy Spirit of God, but we don't have the full payment. Not all God wants for us. That's in heaven. That's in glory. And that's coming. We just have the down payment now. And whilst we're here, we are absent from the Lord in that way. Yes, the Lord's everywhere. And yes, he lives within us. But we still live by faith. One day faith will end in sight. We will no longer live by faith. We will be seeing Jesus and seeing him in his glory, seeing the throne room, seeing what Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 6, where the angels are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory and the post and the door shook and the house was filled with smoke and he fell on his face. I and mean, We'll see all that then, but we've not seen it yet. So now we're still living by faith. But one day, and he said this would be what we would choose. If, if you know the Lord, you'd rather be with him. Oh, I'd rather be with him. He's the lover of my soul. I can't wait till that day. Maybe this week, maybe today. God says we're supposed to live looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 2. He says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Look, if God looked over this week in your life, would you be accepted of him? Oh, be careful before you answer too quickly in our pride. Does this week, does our life line up with the word of God? Have we live for him. We let him have control. We died to self and let the spirit of God live in control through us. This is what our life is to be about. Verse 10, for we must all appear. Why should I be worried about being accepted of him? Here it comes, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Look, if you claim to know Jesus as your savior this morning, hallelujah, you will not be at the great white throne judgment not in judgment. We will be there and see it. I believe we'll have blood on our hands from the people you worked with and you failed to tell when he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel of every creature and you didn't tell them. 
I believe there'll be blood on your hands from neighbors that you never went over and pled with them and tried to persuade them to come to Christ. Oh, God, help us. But we will not stand at the great white throne judgment in judgment. Everyone that stands there in judgment is going to be cast into the lake of fire. Read in Revelation 14 and 15. But we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And if you know the Lord Jesus is your Savior, you're going to stand there. That's what he's saying. For we must all. He's writing this to the church at Corinth. These are saved people, people that profess Christ. I would believe that would be the vast majority of people here professing Christ. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You will not stand with your wife. You will not stand with your husband. You will not stand with your children. You will not stand with your parents. You will stand there naked as if you were before the Lord. The, the seeing eye that sees all and sees through all pretense and all, all things we try to hide. He sees everything and he will see us as we are. Now, thank God, if you know Jesus, your Savior, all sin is under the blood. Hallelujah. We will not stand in judgment for our sin. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8. But we will stand there with the opportunities of what God has given us to do to live for him and what we did. While this good man was gone on his long journey... Well, the master was gone on his long journey and he gave gifts to his servants and said, use it for me. He has been gone so long, did we start to forget and begin to use it and for our own good and for our own things? Or have we stayed faithful serving him, looking for him, believing he's coming back, like he said? We all know we've been guilty of days where we live for self and not for our Savior. This is what he's talking about. We're going to stand before him and give an account of what we've done with what he's put in our hands. Not for our sin. Thank God if you're saved, your sin was judged on Calvary and it is remembered against thee no more. Praise the Lord for that. But we will stand whether we use the opportunity God gave us, the life God gave us, the days God gave us, the health God gave us, the strength God gave us, the mouth God gave us, the feet he gave us, the hands he gave us whether it be good or bad. Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. What do you mean? Well, knowing two things, knowing number one, I'm going to stand before him and give an account. Look, I don't know what type of dad you had, but I had a dad that spanked us. Hallelujah. And he didn't pretend to spank us. He really spanked us. <laughs> okay. And he, he got his money's worth and I'm glad he did. He got my attention. Hallelujah. Right. And, and he spanked us, not in love, not in anger. He wasn't mad. He didn't beat me, but he spanked me where it hurt good. And I learned a lesson. Pain has a strong persuasion, right? But there was a fear when dad said, do this, that if I don't do it, there's going to be, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, I'm going to stand in judgment. See? So there's a fear of that. But there's also this fear that those you know are going to stand before him. And knowing if they do not stand with the blood of Jesus on them, like when they came out of Egypt and the death angel came and in the door, if there was not the blood on the, on the doorpost and on the mantle, then the death angel went in and they were killed. Listen, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Listen, I don't care what you think of me. I am very concerned of what you think of Jesus Christ. Your coworker and your neighbor, whether they think well of you or not, oh, you ought to live with a good testimony and they would be blameless. The Bible talks about that. But what do they think of Jesus Christ? Because that will decide heaven or hell for all eternity for them. Do they know Jesus? Do they know him from your mouth? Have you told him them of Jesus? See, we persuade men, don't you understand? This is true, but we are made manifest unto God, verse 11. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that we may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. I'll zero in here on verse 14 to 21. This is where we'll preach from. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, 
that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That if Jesus died, and I, don't, I doubt there's anyone in this room that would stand up today and say, I don't believe Jesus died on the cross. But if, so if we believe that Jesus died on the cross, that's what he's saying, then we should not henceforth live for ourselves, but unto him which died for us. That's what he's saying. Can I ask you this week, did you live for yourself or for Jesus? And not by your estimation, Jesus even said, it will not be me that judges you, but my word will judge you. Did you live for him this week? Verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Well, who had he imputed their trespass unto? Who did he account or give the blame or give the punishment of their trespasses to? Well, keep reading. Verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be you reconciled to God for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteous of God in him. You say, I don't want to go to Calvary. I don't like looking at that scene. It's so bloody. It's so grotesque. Yes, you see what he became? Verse 21, for he hath made him to be Sin. See, when you look at Calvary, you need to see that's my sin. That's my sin. That's my sin. Look, if you, we, 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 we have our pet sins many times. These sins, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, that so easily beset us. And we like to think, well, that sin's not too bad. And their sin, my goodness, their sin's bad. I'll tell you, his sin's real bad. But my sin, it's not really that big a deal. Look at Calvary. Look how grotesque. That sin is. I've never murdered anybody. I'm not running around on my wife. But yeah, your pride, your covetousness. It's grotesque. It's awful. He became sin for us. See, we need to be reminded of that. Lest in our pride we try to excuse our sin. Instead of coming to God and say, oh Lord, forgive me. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all righteous. But he that covereth this sin, the Bible says, shall not prosper. We try to excuse and cover up and say it's no big deal. You're not going to prosper. God is going to deal with you. Oh, Lord, help us to see the truth. I want to draw your attention to this phrase in verse 14 is where we'll get our title. Verse 14 says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. I want to take that phrase, one died for all. One died for all. Let's pray together. Father, help us. We think about your sacrifice on Calvary. Oh, there's so much to study in your word. Thank you for the study in Ezra. Sunday school, thank you for the study in Genesis. Oh, how we've seen so beautiful pictures of the sacrifice of Jesus, that sacrificial lamb and all of that. But may we not forget the reality. May we not get lost in the picture and the type and forget the real thing. Jesus died for us. One died for all. And Lord, may it grip us again like it did when we first realized it. Maybe there's some here today lost. I pray you'd save them. May they for the first time realize that you died for them, not for someone else. You are a personal savior. You love them. You thought of them. You had them on their, your mind. You're such a great God. You thought of every person that would ever live and you'd paid their sin debt. Thank you, Lord. And I pray you'd help us not just to hear the word of God, but obey your word today. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. And we'll thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen.
One died for all. You know, in a day when my rights are so emphasized, I have my rights. <laughs> Uh, even to the point in our day where children can call, you know, the authorities and their parents, if they're making them do this or that, you know, you're violating the child's rights. And some would protest even in our day that if you put on the birth certificate, male or female, that you violated that child's rights and all kinds of nonsense. But in, in this day, when my rights are so emphasized and I have my rights, many times as Christians, we can forget what the word of God tells us about the secret of the Christian life. You see, this idea of my rights makes the secret of the Christian life seem so much more foreign than it ever has. The secret to the Christian life is death. Death to my rights. Jesus has all my rights. Christ is my life. He bought me with his blood. I have no rights. I'm the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, read every great Christian in the Bible. The Bible writers, all those we look to, and listen what they call themselves. A servant of Jesus Christ. He's the master. He's the Lord. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ means, master. That's what Jesus said. Why call you me Lord, Lord? Why call me, you mean master, master, and do not the things which I say? That's an, that doesn't make sense. Why you keep calling me master, but you're not being the servant? We owe him all our rights. Can you see him on the cross? Oh, what love. If you look closely at the cross, you ought to see on the cross self. Self. It was my death. It was self's death nailed to the cross. It was my death he died. It was the old man's death that he died. It was our death. In verse 14, the Bible says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. He's saying, in light of this divine truth, that the God man, the perfect man, the only one that went about doing good, who the Bible says he, uh, he did not quench a smoking flax. He was gentle. He was loving. He was kind. I mean, what a savior that, that loved the unlovely and would eat with publicans and sinners and, and, and give them the gospel good news just as much as the religious elites or, or the people that were wealthy that people would think those are the ones you want. He, he, he did not show, he was not a respecter of persons. He did not show favoritism. I mean, he was the perfect lamb of God. And yet he died for you, for me. Talk about unlovable, the unlovely, the sin filled life. He died for me. He paid his blood to purchase this, to purchase you. As we're saying, the love of Christ. Why would he do that? For God so loved Amen. the world. For God so loved the world. Not this ball we call earth. Not the ground, the dirt. Uh, no, the world, the people, you. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, any of the world, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, see, he purchased something on Calvary. He purchased your salvation. He purchased your ability to be saved. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He purchased your salvation. And if you've received that salvation, if you've accepted that salvation, then he's purchased you. And that's what he's saying. The love of Christ constraineth us. That word constraineth has the idea of pressure of being formed into a mold, that there, there's this pressure on me. That, that how could I sin against a love like that? How could it be possible that I could sin against a, such love? It constrains me. It draws me with these cords of love. He draws me. The love of Christ constraineth me. That's what he's saying. Because we thus judge, if one died for all, then we're all dead. I mean, come on. If, if some armed robber came to your house tonight and your neighbor was out letting the dog out and saw him and he came over to rush to your aid and he was shot dead, 
you would do everything you could to take care of that man's family. The rest of your days, you would owe a debt to him. And no one would have to tell you that. Some judge wouldn't have to make you do that. It would constrain you that he gave his life up to. That's why we take care of our soldiers and, and, and police people, that, uh, families that have fallen, because they protected us. We could have died. We would have been hurt, but they stood in harm's way, right? Well, how much more? The Lord Jesus. How much more? The Savior. The spotless one took the place of the sinful one. The love of Christ constraineth us. Do you feel it? You feel the pressure of that? It was my death, verse 15, and he, that he died for all. All. Because we thus judge, verse 14, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. What's he saying? Well, number one, my first point, and by the way, as you think about this divine, divine truth, it helps us better understand Paul's passion. Paul was the next ruler of the Jews. Now, now you might think, well, what's the big deal? That was the highest thing he could have done. He was a part of the Sanhedrin. He was brilliant. Paul's brilliant. He gives his pedigree in Philippians 3. He could have done anything he wanted to in that line of work. He was going to be one that was, and he already was one that was admired and looked upon. And yet he says in Philippians chapter 3, and you can understand his passion, same human penman here in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things for loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I've suffered the loss of all things and to count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness, which is of God by faith, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection be made, and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. If that by any means I might attain of the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I already attained. Either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I'm apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. And reaching forward to those things that are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And here's a man that gave up everything. He was the one imprisoning. He was the one saying who would die and live. He stood there and held the clothes while they stoned Stephen. And now he's the one being hunted. And now he's the one being in prison, one being beaten, and one being stoned to death. Why? Because Christ had captivated him. The love of Christ constrained him. It was my death. He died for me. So I own my life. I should be dead. That's what he's saying here in verse 14 and 15. We're, we're all dead. That was our death. We're, we're walking dead men. And so if he died for us, then... We that live because he died should not henceforth live for ourselves, but for him, which died for them and rose again. So his death was our death. So number one, once you see this morning, first of all, he died that we might die. You say, what? Just stay with me a minute. He died that we might die. You see, mankind, ever since Adam's sin in the garden, are under the sentence of death. Like someone that is on death row and they've already been sentenced to death, but the sentence has not been carried out. The day that thou sinnest, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But the sentence was put off. It was not executed immediately. God's grace. And so if you can imagine Adam being born of, on top of a mountain, let's say Lookout Mountain, born on top of a mountain, in innocence, he lived and walked with God in the cool of the day. And he was born in innocence, no sin, clothed with light. Pretty amazing. Adam and Eve, both of them there. But it wasn't long, they sinned. And when they sinned, they tumbled off the mountain down into the valley of sin. And in that valley, they would bring forth a race of sinful men. And Jesus because of his love came. And he didn't come to this world and come to the top of the mountain because there was no one there. He came down in the valley with you and I. And he lived a sinless life, 
but died for all the sin of all mankind ever. He died, not just our death, not just for us, but he died as us. He took on him the sin. The Bible says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. We that were dead in our trespasses and sin, he came down to the place of death where all men were, and the Bible says in verse 15, and that he died for all. Because men were dead, the sentence of death upon us, he went down into death. He came to us when we could not come to him. He came to us. He came to where we were. And now he brings believers up with him in resurrection life. And not back on the mountain of innocence, no, but to heaven. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together, made alive with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Oh, what grace. And hath raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, now verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Can I ask you, do you remember the first time you realized that Jesus died on the cross for you? I mean, since I was a boy, I, I have always known, I can't remember a time I didn't know that Jesus had died on the cross. But I, I vividly remember the first time I realized that Jesus died for me. That was my cross. It became personal. See, nothing's dynamic till it's personal, till it's specific. It became personal. He died for me. I was the sinner that he died for, don't you see? You remember when you realized that Jesus died for you? And the Holy Spirit of God pressed that to your understanding that Jesus took your place. He died to, for you. I want you to know if you're lost here this morning, He took your place on Calvary that you could be saved. Amen. He's not on the cross anymore. And we don't have a crucifix up here. We have an empty cross because he died and was buried and he rose from the grave and he's alive. And if you come in just a little bit, we have invitation. The Lord Jesus, spiritually speaking, will meet you with nail pierced hands and help you to come to him and be saved. He says, he that cometh to me, I'll no wise cast out. Oh, he'll receive you. He loves you. He died for you. No one wants you to be saved more than Jesus who shed his blood for you. See, he loves you. He died in your place. You see that he died and made us alive in the spirit. Because he did that, we can die. We can die to self. We can die to this sin nature that is in us. Turn over to Romans 6. I want to show it to you because I know you're looking at me a little funny. He died that we might die. Romans chapter 6. Look, before you were saved, you had one nature and you could not get away from it. You were bound in the chain of sin and you could turn over as many new leaves as you wanted to. You could put new paint on the old barn, but you could not make it new. You had one nature, the sin nature, and it was this body of death you carried and could not get rid of. Putrefying. Read Romans chapter 7. That's exactly what he talks about. It's a body of death. Who should deliver us from this body of death? Thank God he is the one that delivers us. But Romans 6, notice what he says here in verse 6. Romans 6, verse 6. Knowing this. Well, God wants us to know some things. I don't know if you noticed in 2 Corinthians 5 where we begin reading verse 1. He said, for we know. With God, you don't deal with question marks. The devil deals with question marks and uncertainty and fear. God deals with exclamation points and periods. We know. I love that. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth, boy, that's a word we read over here in 2 Corinthians. That henceforth we should not serve sin. 
before you were saved, you served sin. Excuse me, if you're not saved here today, I'm telling you what you're serving. You're not free, you're serving sin. And what sin you think is your freedom, you're entangled with. It's, that's the truth of anyone that sins. We, we, we serve sin, verse seven, for he that is dead is freed from sin. <laughs> Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So he's saying in Romans 6, Jesus died so that we could die with him. And he that is dead is freed from sin. He that is dead is freed from the law. You no longer are servant to it. You're no longer under it. You've died with Jesus. So you might be resurrected to walk in this newness of life. You no longer have one nature. If you're saved, you have a new nature. <laughs> we read about it back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's something new in you. It's Jesus. It's a new nature. You're no longer bound to serve sin. You can now serve him. Oh, what privilege. He died so we could die. Remember what Jesus said, John 12, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Amen. See, the way you and I can be used of God to bring forth much fruit is we must die. We must die with him. Before Christ, there was nothing else, just one nature, just the old man, just the flesh, just that body of death. For the wages of sin is death. The wrath of God abided on us already, the Bible said. We were condemned already. Man, like that death sentence on someone on death row. It hadn't been carried out, but we were already condemned. The last enemy that is destroyed in the believer is self. Self dies hard, see. It's hard to do, but it must be done. Paul would say, I die daily. There's no abiding peace or power or prosperity in the Christian life without death to self. Oh, with satanic subtlety, our self likes to deceive us. Galatians 5 verse 24 says, and they that are Christ. How many of you say this morning, I'm Christ, I've been saved. Praise God. This is for you then. Galatians 5, 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. What he's saying is when you die to your flesh, you're doing what Jesus did in that garden. Not my will, but thine be done. With the affection and lust, the things we want, the things we desire, that lust just mean wants, the wants of, of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. I crucify that. I'm dead to that. Okay, why? Verse 25, Galatians 5, 25. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let me read you what A.B. Simpson said. I am crucified with Jesus and the cross has set me free. I've risen again with Jesus and he lives and reigns in me. It's sweet to die with Jesus to the world and self and sin. It's sweet to live with Jesus as he lives and reigns within. This the story of the master. Through the cross he reached the throne and like him our path to glory ever leads through death alone. Through death. He died that we might die. Number two, more of what you would expect, I would assume he died that we might live. See, first he died that we might die. Die to this old man. Die to self. Die to that old nature. He died now that we might live. Look at verse 15 back in 2 Corinthians 5. His death was our death. He died that we might live, verse 15, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. So we were all dead. One died for all, then we're all dead, but now we're alive. And then we should not henceforth live unto ourselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. <laughs> yea, though we have known Christ of the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. I mean, there was a time when Jesus was alive on this earth in the flesh. He's no longer. That's what he's saying there. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We're not living in the flesh anymore. We don't walk by the flesh anymore. We're to walk in the spirit now. A new creature, a new creation. This is new. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, what's the new man? The new man is Jesus Christ. The new nature is Christ's nature in us. Christ who is our life. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Bible says. Oh, Romans 6, 3 and 4, where you were just a minute ago, he talks about uh, this newness of life. Baptism is a picture of that. We have a new life. We're resurrected with him. We, we picture that in the ordinance of baptism. That's what we're supposed to experience every day. Every day we're supposed to die to self. We're to crucify the flesh and experience the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in our life every day. That's what Paul was saying in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. In, in his life, in your life, you can know the power of his resurrection when Jesus starts living in you. That's what he wants to do. That's what he died to do. He died that we might die. He died that we might live. Look, some of you have been saved 40, maybe 50, maybe 60 years. What, what hope do you give to a new Christian that's just newly been saved? When you're, they're 60 years your junior, spiritually speaking. Well, I'll tell you, that's why I'm so glad God makes it so simple. You understand in this New Testament, when the Bible says the world was turned upside down, it wasn't turned upside down by people that have been saved 40, 50 years. It was turned upside down by new believers, by people that were naive enough, excuse me, naive enough to believe that if they would die to self, Jesus would live through them. Naive enough to believe what the Bible said. And they're the ones that turned the world upside down. They let Christ live in them. Let me just preach to myself for a minute. Sir, there's nothing good in you. There's nothing good in you. Sir, ma'am, there's nothing good in you. Nothing. Nothing. Quit trying to make you look so good. There's nothing good in you. Why are we trying to look self, make self look so good? There's nothing good in you. Quit thinking your opinion. Your preference is so important. There's nothing good in you. Quit trying to think you're so right. Quit trying to make you look so good. And start trying to make him look so good. See, that's the problem. We're so concerned about what people think of us when our concern ought to be what people think of him. Yes. We're to be dead. Well, you've heard this illustration. Go to, go to the casket of somebody and call them every vile name. Guess what they'll say to you? Nothing. Why? Because they're dead. Go to the casket and say every compliment you can think of. Build them up like some amazing person. They're going to get a big head and full of pride? Nope. Why? They're dead. Go ahead and punch them. Hit them. They're going to hit back? Nope. Why? They're dead. That's what he's saying. When we're dead, we're not worried about this. We're worried about him. That's why Paul could go on when he was thrown out of cities. We don't want you. We don't want your gospel. When they beat him, when they stoned him. Like, Paul, don't you get the message? They don't want it. It doesn't matter. I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for him. The love of Christ constrains me. See? See, we talk ourselves into that sometimes. My neighbors don't want to hear it. My coworkers, they, they, they don't want to talk about Jesus. They don't want to talk about God. Don't you know? Stay away from those two topics, politics and religion. Listen, I'm not talking about Jesus because it's for me. I'm doing it for him. I'm not doing it because they like it in season or they don't like it out of season. I'm doing it because the love of Christ compels me to. The one that died for me, I'm letting live through me. And Jesus talks about the gospel. Paul said, I preach Christ and him crucified. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what his life was all about. He died that we might live. It's been well said that Christ died our death for us, that we might live his life for him. Look, we're not called to imitate Christ. We're not called to be a copy of him. 
Our supreme business is to let him live. Let him live. Let him live through you. That's what Paul was saying, Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. God didn't call you to imitate Jesus. You couldn't. He didn't call you to be a copy of him. He called you to die so that he could live through you. That's why Jesus would say to his disciples, when I'm gone, you'll do more and greater works than I've ever done. Why? Because Jesus in you, 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 all over the globe for every Christian, Jesus Christ can work through. In his flesh, in that one body he limited himself to, he could be at one place at one time when he walked the earth. But now in his resurrection, the spirit of God can fill every one of us. And if we will die to self and let that nature, that new nature, Christ in you, the hope of glory come through, then Jesus lives everywhere a Christian lives. And that's what God said he would do and could do. If we let him, he died that we might live. One person said this risen life is not the imitation of a splendid model, but the indwelling of a living person. If us as lost sinners have been to the cross and have been saved, how can we spend the rest of our lives in selfishness? In 1858, Francis Ridley Havergal visited Germany with her father. He was getting treatment for his eyesight that was bad. And while they were in a pastor's home staying, she saw a picture of a, a cru the crucifixion, this crucifixion scene on the wall. And the words under it said this, I did this for thee. What hast thou done for me? I want to ask you in this message, when did you die? I did this for thee. What hast thou done for me? What well, Francis Ridley Havergal took out a piece of paper and wrote a poem quickly. She wasn't happy with it and threw it in the fire. Amazingly, it didn't catch on fire, didn't burn, and later her dad got it. And we sing it. P.P. Bliss put a tune to it. It's this poem is what she wrote that we sing. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? My father's house of light, my glory, circled throne. I left for earthly night, for wandering, sad and lone. I left, I left it all for thee. Hast thou left aught for me? I left, I left it all for thee. Hast thou left aught for me? I suffered much more. I suffered much for thee, more than any uh, thy tongue can tell. A bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? And I have brought to thee down from my home above salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me? I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me? Hmm. Back in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we've known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. We see through different eyes now. Yet not after the flesh now. We're not living, but we're living by the Spirit. We used to belong to the world, and we lived on that sin nature, but not now. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We have a new view of people around us. We don't see sinners like we used to see them. We see them as sinners for whom Christ died. We see them as someone that my best friend died for. We don't see them as friends and enemies. We don't see them as customers and co-workers. We see them the way Christ sees them, lost sheep that need a shepherd. I remember the Terrells talking to us about going to the Middle East and people that had, uh, as you think of that area, thought about people that had died that's right. It's okay. Look right here. Everything's okay. People that had died, they had killed terrorists, had taken them out. Think about it. And we're going to go witness to them, give the gospel. These are people that are our enemies. 9-11, because of these people. And yet here they went as missionaries. He said, they said what had to happen was we had to think of them as Jesus thought of them. He loved them. He died for them and he loved them like as much as he loves you and loves me. 
Now that's not easy to do. It takes death first to self and Jesus' life in you. I know what's going on. I've I seen the headlines. But I want you to know as much as Jesus loves you, he loves each of those terrorists. As much as Jesus loves you, he loves those Jews. He died for all of them and every one of them must get saved the same way by looking to Jesus on Calvary, receiving him as their Messiah. See, those old relationships, the way we used to view people in the flesh, those old relationships have passed away. We're no longer identified with the first Adam, but with the second Adam. We're no longer identified with this world system. We're now identified with Christ. We've been baptized in the body of believers. We belong to him. The old things are passed away. And the new thing is this new relationship with the Lord Jesus. It changed everything. It's changed everything. If we'll die daily to self. And thirdly, last thing we're done, he died that we might reconcile. Say, so what do I do with this message, pastor? He died that we might reconcile. Verse 18, and all things are of God. What all things? Behold, all things are become new and all things are of God. Verse 18, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That could be like a government office. The ministry of this, the ministry of that. In Canada, they use that word a lot. The ministry that's a government place. Ministry of Agriculture, whatever. He's given you and I an official role, the Ministry of Reconciliation. Keep reading. Verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. You see, when Adam sinned back there in the Garden of Eden, a holy God could not reach down and save him. He had to deal with his sin. A holy God just can't say, oh, sin's okay. Just come on in. I love you so much. No, sin's not okay. Sin must be dealt with. And so that's what he's saying there to wit. He says there in verse 19 that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing or accounting their trespasses unto them who deserved it, but rather unto himself. He paid for it. For God hath made him, verse 21, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteous of God in him. Think about it. What God has done. God had to do something with our sin. And today, because of Christ's death, the position of the world has been changed. Today, God's arms are outstretched to a lost world. Come to me. Come to me. I'll save you. Come. The worst sinner in the world can come to him and be saved. Today, it doesn't make any difference who you are. You can come to him. You see, Christ didn't come to charge man's sin against him. Christ came to pay man's debt. The woman caught in adultery in John 8, God wasn't interested in condemning her. He came to save her. Yes, he said, go and sin no more, but she couldn't pay for her sin. If they had stoned her, she couldn't have paid for her sin. Jesus was the only one that could pay for her. That's why he came. Not to charge us, we were condemned already, but to pay our sin debt. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciled the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Condemnation was to fall on him. And because she trusted him, that woman caught in adultery, went away uncondemned. And he says in verse 20, he gives you a title, friend, and we're through. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Webster's definition of ambassador is a minister. An ambassador is a minister of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government or sovereign as the official representative is of his own government or sovereign. I'd like to ask you, how have you done this week with this title? How have you done in your role as an ambassador of Jesus Christ? He doesn't ask you if you want to be one. He says, if you're saved, verse 20, thou then you are. We are ambassadors for Christ. Like when he said, ye are witnesses of these things. You're a witness. You're an ambassador. You've been saved. Look, when a government sends an ambassador to a country, they're on at least somewhat friendly terms. If they're going to go to war, they call ambassadors out. They pull out their embassy. They pull out. God is on somewhat friendly terms with this world. He has ambassadors everywhere, and you're one of them. And the ambassador's job is to make peace 
with that nation and keep peace with that nation and the, his nation. And so God has not declared war on the world. At the cross, he declared peace. Peace through the blood of Jesus. But one day soon, the ambassadors are going to be taken out. And we'll be gone. And then he will declare war. The Bible says the wrath of the Lamb will be unleashed on this world. But for now, those that reject the Savior, there's still hope. There's still uh, opportunity of peace. And Satan wants to tear everything apart. But Christ and his church are involved in the ministry of reconciliation. Bringing things back together again. And as his ambassadors, we're to be telling people everywhere we go, God will save you. God will save you. God will save you. Come to him. All God's asking any man to do is come to him. Just come to him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can I ask you? He's delivered. He's given us this word of reconciliation. Have you got this word out to anyone this week? Have you? Have you delivered this word of reconciliation? You're an ambassador, don't you know? Have you been about your ambassador business this week? That's what God's called us to. He died so that we can reconcile your ambassadors. He's, he's delivered unto us this ministry of reconciliation. We say, I don't think I can do that. Yeah, that's why we need him. That's why we must die to self and let him live through us. Oh, what an ambassador he is. Whoever you are, wherever you are, however you are, whatever you're doing today, what are you doing today to get the word of reconciliation to people, to a lost world? See, that's what he's saying in verse 20. Is Jesus Christ still on this earth, yes or no? Physically, no. Verse 20, that's what he's saying. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Look, if Jesus Christ was here, he'd be going to each person, be saved. Come to me. I died for you. I love you. I mean, he would be going. But he's not here. He died so you could die to this old nature. He died so you could live. And now you and I in Christ's stead said, let's be reconciled to God. He loved you. If he was here, he'd say these very same things. He left this book and he said to us, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. As the Father sent me, so send I you. We're sent with the same authority that Jesus had. And in his stead, we're bringing people to him. And he'll receive you if you come to him. Jesus wants to use you like that. The story goes of this poor, poor man. Decided to sell his old shack. Before he sold it, he thought, I'll fix it up. So he began to try to patch. It's an old shack, run down. And he tried to repair it and patch the roof. And he kind of started feeling a sense of pride when this rich guy wanted to buy his shack. Well, as soon as the exchange happened and the money was transferred, the rich man had his people start tearing the shack down. The poor man went to the, the, the old rich man. Hey, don't tear it down. This house was a special place for me. That was my home and, and things. Don't tear it down. The rich man said, sir, I didn't buy this place for the shack. I bought it for the site. I wanted the corner lot. Look, you and I, we can try to fix up our shack with our fleshly work. But God didn't purchase you for the shack. He purchased you for the site. He wants you. He wants to build in you, by him, through you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, something that would bring honor and glory to him. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? And you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God, your body and your spirit, which are God's. Friend, let him have yourself. Let him build the fabric of his new creature and show to men his life, not yours. Will you bow with me in prayer?